Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Let's go. Hey, guys. Okay. All right. We are doing the next episode of... How you guys doing, by the way? Good? Bad? Good? Bad? Good? You'll be the opposite soon. Don't worry. Or worry, depending on your current status. All right. Uh, continuing um, the uh, series chosen in the poll. I know you guys also uh, voted on a longer... Uh, Muslim expansion, I think Kings and Generals video, I believe, or Baz Battles, or History March, or Epic History T one of those channels. And, uh, so yeah, I'll start that soon, uh, that's the longer series. It's actually one big video, I'll have to break it up, break it up into smaller pieces. Alright, let's go. Original link to the video, top of the description below. My name's Connor. If you're new, hello. I'm from Rhode Island, New England, America, in that order. And I like to learn about history to YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video. <laughs> I was about to say the original link to the video is right over there. If you are not ready to learn, the door is right over there. You're in the wrong class, my friend. Home is down the hall. Make me... I, I surprise me. I don't know. Okay. Preemptive like the nineteen eighteen flu pandemic, trench fever, fever, blah. Extra history number two. Let's go. It stalked into camp when the day was damp and chilly and cold. It crept by the guards and murdered my pards with a hand that was clammy and bony and bold, and its breath was icy and moldy and dank. And it killed so speedy and gloatingly greedy that it took away men from each company rank. Private Joshua Lee, 34th Infantry Division, 1919. When we left off, the 1918 flu was aboard troop transports headed for the battlefields of France. And though this first wave of the virus was comparatively mild, its time in the trenches would reforge it into a hardened killer of men and help tip the balance of the war. In early April, it erupted among the American troops at their disembarkation ground in Breste. By April 10th, the first cases began showing up in the French Actually, army. Actually, I feel like in a wartime environment, the virus would become less hardy because it actually has the perfect conditions to spread <laughs> i'm sorry the balance of the war in early april it erupted among the american troops at their disembarkation ground in breste by april 10th the first cases began showing up in the french army which generally trained and served alongside american units it was hard to notice at first high fever headache and weakness could come from many diseases that swirled around the trenches such as insect-borne trench fever or typhus but it soon became clear that this was different the troops called it three-day fever, knock-me-down fever, or la grip. It rarely killed. You were dead in three days, even a healthy. Killed, but men who got it were man. out of action for days and lead-footed for weeks. Okay. The overcrowded camps and trenches of the Western Front were ideal tinder for an epidemic. Men lived within inches of each other, their immune systems compromised from exhaustion and disease. And unlike a city where the virus might run out of victims, here, fresh bodies were rotated onto the line every few days. Right, exactly. That's why I thought... You know, this isn't a hard situation for a virus to become this war-hardened, you know, that, you know, eye-patched little cute thing. This is like daycare for a virus. It, it, it's, it is the easiest place to survive. It spread to the British in early May. And Ooh, by nice. then, there was no hope of containment. It swept through them like a bad spirit. English hospitals saw over 36,000 admissions for flu in a single month. Only then, when it began undermining the troops' ability to fight, did military doctors raise the alarm. The outbreak had sprung up during a critical phase of the war. The Germans had launched a massive spring offensive, and Allied generals needed every man possible on the line. But Hey guys, why didn't Germans go back to this flag after Nazi Germany um, in the Swatchka and whatnot? I, I like this flag even more so. 
listen, I, I'm going to say I'm not a huge fan of the German flag. I'm also not a huge fan of the American flag, all right? I, I think... I just don't like the design, and I think the German flag and the Belgian flag are... I, I guess I just don't like the colors that much, but I, I like this red, white, and uh, and black right here. Launched a massive spring offensive, Should have gone and back Allied to generals needed every man possible on the line. But as spring turned to summer, the frontline hospitals of the Allies swelled to overcapacity. Men on the front lines would get ready to rotate to the rear, only to find that the unit ordered to relieve them had instead gone into quarantine. Medical tents had run out of space, Great. and some hospitals took to laying patients outside on canvas tarps. In late May, a group of French recruits came down with it. 69% of them had to be hospitalized, and 5% died. By the end of the summer, 10% of the British Army had fallen ill. Back in Washington, D.C., Welch and his epidemiologists finally took notice. The flu, previously ignored, became a matter of national security. They set about turning the Rockefeller Institute into an information gathering and communication center for the disease. Welch wanted anything he could get his hands on. Reports, lung samples, information on treatment. So he dispatched doctors to centers of infection to swab throats and collect samples. But all of it remained a closely guarded secret. No one wanted the central powers to know that the allies were being weakened by disease. So it seems like this was a, an even more deadly disease than COVID is like we're dealing with because these are you know very healthy uh, yes they're living in bad conditions but even even the men who are training and and camps were falling very ill and covid tends to affect mostly those who are have some pre-existing condition are, aren't very healthy or a bit overweight or are older and so I feel like it wouldn't be as big of a deal if 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 they replaced the Spanish flu with the flu we have today, you know, the COVID um what is it called? Whatever, you know, COVID uh, it seems like also imagine if if the COVID stuff if it hurt like young people, like children as much as it did uh old people. That would have been crazy. I'm sure, obviously, there would have been much more eagerness to, to, you know, lock down. Upon entering the war, both the U.S. and Britain had clamped down on the press with unprecedented censorship measures. When American officers denied or minimized reports of the flu, newspapers at home accepted it without question. The British, for their part, tried to strangle any mention of the spreading plague. But with the virus now infecting the civilian population, news of an epidemic started to leak. In May, the virus arrived in Madrid. I knew it. You see, this is how it happens, isn't it? Spain got the... So this flu got the name the Spanish flu, Spanish influenza. Not because it started in Spain, but um, because th they were the ones to... You know, they were one of the only governments or the only major government to say, hey, uh, there's this thing going on. While the others were kind of swiping it under the rug. And since Spain was neutral, it wasn't subject to wartime censorship. There, the flu made front page news, especially once it infected the king. It whipped through Spanish cities, passing from person to person so fast that local wits named it after a hit opera song, The Naples Soldier. It was as catchy as the song, the joke went if more deadly. International newspapers picked up the story. Is this it? Sorry, all right. Story on the Madrid outbreak and, erroneously, assumed the disease had originated there. And from those articles, the killer gained another name the Spanish flu. But it wasn't just the Allies covering up the flu's impact. On the other side of no man's land, the German commander, General Ludendorff, was also wrestling with the disease. Ludendorff had gained day-to-day -day command Wait, so of the German military. question. Did the Spanish even know of the flu outside Spain, or did they just see this new flu, and they're like, hey guys, there's this new thing, and everyone else is sort of like, yeah, we know, but we have the war going on. Terry in 1916, along with a huge amount of political power, and he'd used it to embark on a bold plan to save the Kaiser and Germany. And to be honest, it hadn't gone so well. 
First, he'd planned to crush the Allied supply lines with unrestricted submarine warfare. Instead, it had helped drag America into the conflict. Now, 84,000 Americans were arriving on the Western Front each month. But that would be a surmountable problem if he could knock Russia out of the war and free up the troops fighting on the Eastern Front. Luckily for him, a revolution had broken out against the Tsar. And to fuel the chaos, he helped transport a famous How did they lose? How did they lose? Imagine in World War II, if in 1942, the Russians just had this major revolution and they were knocked out of the war. I I've seen enough tick videos to uh, know better than to just say Germany would have won. But um, how did they not win? They were in a seem seemingly a stalemate and then they get an entire front freed up. And so now all Austria, Hungary, Ottomans, whatever, you know, they aren't the greatest help. Um, but Germany has to do now is focus on the West. And then they seem to just collapse. Bolshevik revolutionary won Vladimir Lenin back to Russia. Tommy. The plan worked. Kinda. Ludendorff had hoped the strict peace terms he'd foisted on Russia would scare other allies into opening negotiations. But instead, the harsh treaty only had convinced them that peace was not possible until they achieved total victory, and forced an equally punishing treaty on Germany. But at least Ludendorff now had his 50 divisions from the Eastern Front, and he'd use them for one more, all or nothing shot at winning the war. He'd retrained the freed up- Wait. To open Ludendorff this is important. Mir Lenin back to Russia. The plan worked. Kinda. Ludendorff had hoped the strict peace terms he'd foisted on Russia. What were those peace terms on Russia? And I want to compare them to the peace terms at the Treaty of Versailles in Germany to see if Germany is a hypocrite. Would scare other allies into opening negotiations. But instead, the harsh treaty only had convinced them that peace was not possible until they achieved total victory and forced an equally punishing treaty on Germany. But at least Ludendorff now had his 50 divisions from the Eastern Front, and he'd use them for one more. Sorry, one more question. Do you think if Germany knew the, the, um, what was in the Treaty of Versailles before surrendering, do you think they still would have had to surrender? Or do you think they would have been like, no way? Or all or nothing shot at winning the war. He'd retrained the freed-up veterans as assault specialists, stormtroopers, and launched his massive spring offensive in hopes of securing victory before the Americans arrived in force. As the offensive began, Ludendorff's army had better trained troops, superior tactics, higher morale, and for a brief time, numerical superiority. And at the beginning, it all went so well. German troops had captured more what territory happened? than they had since 1914 and driven a wedge between the British and the French. But the Allies had held on to the strategic port roads and railroad junctions. All the ground that Ludendorff captured was worthless, shell churned dirt. And they'd taken a lot of casualties. So the next phase of the operation was critical. But as he began to organize for a final push, his generals requested a delay. The German army, you see, had the flu. They'd caught it in June, Join probably from a British prisoner of war. And by July, it was sweeping the ranks. German troops, their systems already weak from food rationing, appeared especially susceptible to infection. Half a million soldiers were sick. In some units, a quarter of the men were too ill to fight. Ludendorff delayed the attack five days. After that, the commanders would just have to deal with the reduced unit strength. Meanwhile, the Allies, who had caught the flu earlier in the spring and summer, were recovering. Despite sickness, exhaustion, and casualty depletion, on July 15th, the German... Is that really why? An army. So did the Spanish flu actually have a major effect on the outcome of World War One? And don't say yeah, clearly. I mean in that it the worst of it hit the West uh the Allies first, Western Allies first, and then when Russia came out of the war and it was a one front war, it then hit Germany full on. Be marshaled for their one last attack. A rolling bombardment pounded the French and American lines as they advanced. Stormtroopers rushed behind with fast moving infiltration tactics. Gas shells turned the battlefield into a chemical hell. 
but the French, British, and Americans held and counterattacked. And they would keep counterattacking for a hundred days, pushing the Germans back step by step. Ludendorff had failed. Within weeks, he was shut in his office, suffering a nervous breakdown. And by October, he was fleeing across the Swedish border in sunglasses and a fake beard. Now, it would be wrong to say the flu defeated Ludendorff's spring offensive because there were other factors. It was an overambitious operation with a nebulous goal. He kept changing the objectives. It was in their supply lines, and he lost too many men. But German accounts do suggest the flu bled the army's manpower and resolve at a critical moment. And just as it had tipped the balance, it was gone. In August, British hospitalizations fell to the point that they had declared the epidemic over. But it wasn't over. For as the balance of the war was shifting, so were the virus's genes. Even today, no one's sure what happened. Perhaps the original, deadly virus had temporarily mutated into a mild strain, only to have its lethality reemerge. Or it may have infected someone, even an animal, that had a different version of the flu and the two viruses combined. It's even possible that, as it passed through millions of soldiers, this avian virus was gradually adapting itself to human hosts. Most frightening of all, was. the war itself may have given it a nudge, because the soldiers the flu infected had been exposed to a chemical agent known to cause genetic mutation, mustard gas. The soldier's throat and oh, lungs... I, I thought I was going to say it, it would cause permanent damage to the lungs, which I'm sure it would, and then it would make it easier to be infected. And cells laced with chemical weapons... Or at least easier for the symptoms to cause the desired effect. ...may have helped increase the rate of genetic shift and raise the likelihood that a new strain would develop. However uh, it happened, the virus that emerged from the trenches was both highly contagious and severely lethal. It could kill within 24 hours of presenting symptoms, drowning a patient in their own fluids. Like, to me, this should be, like, he should have drawn it as just incredibly happy. Could kill within 24 hours of presenting symptoms, drowning a patient in their own fluids. And while common flu strains Yeesh. primarily kill the very old and very young, the 1918 flu struck people down in the prime of life. The mild first wave was over, and the second lethal wave was about to begin. In fact, it was already making itself known on the troop ships delivering soldiers to nations across the globe. The Naples soldier was on the march. I can't believe this is only two of six. Okay, let's see what happens later. Awesome video. I will continue it for sure. Yeah, I, I tend to kind of get everything out that I wanted to say during the video, so... You kind of know what I wanted, and I don't have much to say afterwards, except that I'm excited for the next episode, and you should be too. Hit all the buttons. See you next time.